Hi, I'm Danny and welcome to a box medicine tutorial on diverticular disease. In this tutorial, I'm going to briefly tell you what this condition is, its risk factors, and then I'll spend some time drawing and explaining some of the complications of this very common condition and also how these complications are managed. Here is a schematic that breaks down the different layers of the wall of a generic section of bowel. The main layers of the large bowel wall are as follows. Facing the lumen is the mucosa, which is lined with epithelium and contains mucus secreting goblet cells and muscularis mucosa. Then there is the submucosa, which contains the blood vessels and nerves. Next up is the muscularis propria, and herein lies an inner circular muscular layer and an outer longitudinal muscular layer, which is condensed in the large bowel to three tinea coli. Finally, the serosa is the outermost layer, and essentially it is simply the visceral layer of peritoneum. So what is a diverticulum? Well, a diverticulum is a herniation of mucosa through the muscularis propria. Although diverticular disease, or diverticulosis, may predominantly affect the sigmoid, diverticular can be present anywhere along the length of the colon. So how and why does diverticular disease develop? I don't think anybody knows for sure, but here is a theory you might read about in the literature. The first thing to consider is that in the large bowel, the outer longitudinal layer of muscle, as we have seen, is condensed into the tinea coli, leaving longitudinal areas in between that are relatively weak and so are vulnerable to mucosal herniation. Secondly, blood vessels need to reach the mucosa, so they perforate through the strong muscularis propria through a small tunnel, which is another area of weakness. Now, as the pressure in the large bowel increases, over time, mucosal herniation may occur in these areas. It may be that as people get older, as collagen cross-linking increases in the submucosa, the bowel will become stiffer and less compliant during contraction, and this may also contribute to mucosal herniation. And indeed, abnormal motility may also have a role in the pathogenesis of diverticular disease. So now a few key risk factors you need to know about. First up is age. Diverticular disease is rare before the age of 30, although it can happen. It becomes more common after age 40, and by the time you get to 60, one in three will have it, and one in two will have it in those older than 70. Diverticular disease is particularly common in Western countries, and it is felt that this may be due to a diet poor in fiber. Finally, diverticular disease is more prevalent in those who are obese. Diverticular disease is so common, but it doesn't always cause a problem. Acute complications, which we're going to concentrate on, include acute diverticulitis, which can vary in severity from an inflamed segment of bowel or inflamed diverticulum, right the way through to perforation with generalized fecal peritonitis. Another acute complication is diverticular bleeding. The chronic complications of diverticular disease include fistulation, commonly between bladder and bowel, and stricturing, and I'll mention these two again towards the end of the tutorial. So what are the factors that make acute complications more likely? Well, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are associated with a high risk of diverticular complications, and it has been shown that smoking may increase complications in female patients. Diverticulitis in the younger age group is more likely to affect men, and in this younger age group, patients are more likely to suffer recurrent problems than older patients. Meanwhile, in the older age group, diverticulitis is more likely to affect females. Finally, it has been hypothesized that indigestible foods blocking diverticular could cause them to become inflamed, such as seeds, for example. But this is now felt, by some at least, well, it might well be a bit of a load of rubbish. So now we know quite a bit about diverticular disease, but as a junior doctor, how does this affect you and your practice? Let's now go over what you need to understand when it comes to seeing a patient suffering from either of the two acute complications we have mentioned, concentrating on acute diverticulitis and then moving on to diverticular bleeding.
Diverticulitis is inflammation of a diverticulum. It typically presents with left iliac fossa pain, a change in bowel habit with or without fever. As part of the history in someone with left iliac fossa pain, ask them specifically if they already know that they have diverticular disease or if they have previously had a colonoscopy. On examination, patients with diverticulitis may have normal vital signs and no fever, simply with some tenderness in the left iliac fossa typically. But if it is severe or if there is an abdominal abscess or frank perforation, then your patient may be profoundly septic with local or generalised peritonism. The signs of peritonism, remember, include guarding, rebound tenderness and percussion tenderness. Now, by this time, you also have made sure you have given the patient some oxygen as necessary, gotten a peripheral line, started some IV fluids, considered prescribing some antibiotics, and inserting a urethral catheter in order to measure the patient's urine output. Now have a think about the investigations you would like to organise. First up is our six simple tests you need to consider for any patient. Check the capillary blood glucose as sepsis may drive this up and this is particularly important in diabetic patients. An electrocardiogram is always useful as a baseline. A urine dip is important as urinary tract infection or calculus are both important differential diagnoses. Send off some blood tests. In diverticulitis you will expect to see raised white cell count and CRP. An arterial or venous gas should be performed if your patient is unwell and also have a look at the lactate. Finally, arrange some plain radiographs, particularly to look for a pneumoperitoneum on an erect chest radiograph. Or perhaps you might see faecal loading on an abdominal film in a well patient who is actually simply suffering from constipation. If you want to definitively make the diagnosis, then CT is the gold standard. Ultrasound can be used, but it is simply not as sensitive or as specific as CT. Not only should a CT scan make the diagnosis, but it will help to exclude other differentials and it will also determine whether or not you have a case of complicated diverticulitis. Complicated diverticulitis describes the presence of an abscess or a perforation and can be graded and managed according to the Hinchy classification system. Hinchy 1 describes a paracolic abscess. As they say, if there's pus about, let it out. So if it is large enough and accessible, then a percutaneous drain would be the treatment of choice, although small and inaccessible abscesses may be carefully treated with a course of antibiotics. Hinchy 2 describes an abscess that has developed elsewhere, for example in the pelvis, which is the dependent part of the peritoneal cavity. We also would like to treat these with a percutaneous drain. Hinchy 3 and 4, however, need proper operations. Hinchy 3 describes generalised purulent peritonitis, so an abdomen full of free pus, not faeces, with generalised inflammation of the peritoneum. Although a Hartman's procedure may be performed, Hinchy 3 patients can often be treated by a simple laparoscopic washout, so that's keyhole surgery with a wash of the peritoneal cavity, leaving one or two large drains. However, once you get to a Hinchy 4, so that's faecal peritonitis, this mandates a laparotomy and Hartman's procedure. Now, I remember getting a bit confused about what a Hartman's procedure is, but then I learned it's really quite simple. You get the diseased bit of bowel, you put it in the bucket, bring the end out as an end stoma and close off the other distal end, or you could bring it up as a mucous fistula. Although there's no guarantee, this stoma does not necessarily have to be permanent, as a reversal of Hartman's might be an option in the future where bowel continuity is restored once everything has settled down. So that's the Hinchy classification system and we have used it to help understand how we treat cases of complicated diverticulitis. Do bear in mind though that it is only a guide and management decisions need to be tailored to individual patients. In cases of simple diverticulitis, as many are, a simple course of antibiotics that cover gram-negative and anaerobic organisms is currently the gold standard of treatment. After an attack of diverticulitis, depending on the individual, we often consider a colonoscopy or flexible sigmoidoscopy in order to make sure that the offending segment of large bowel does not actually harbour a cancer that is sneakily mimicking diverticulitis. 
as it is often difficult to differentiate between the two on CT during an inflammatory phase. Many wait around six weeks after the acute phase before the endoscopy in order to avoid poking a hole or blowing a hole in a fragile and inflamed area of bowel. However, some say that endoscopy can be performed after one or two weeks if the endoscopist is very, very careful. The prognosis of a single attack of diverticulitis depends on its severity and on the pre-morbid condition of the patient. Suffice to say, the highest risk of sepsis and death is with the first episode, with a recurrence rate per year of around 2%. You should also appreciate that faecal peritonitis carries a massive risk of death, and you should appreciate that particularly when counselling with relatives. Now bear in mind, it's not just about the initial septic episode, but the period after a big operation, when respiratory wound and further intra-abdominal septic complications may be encountered. So that's acute diverticulitis. Now let's talk about diverticular bleeding. When it comes to GI bleeding, the principles are important. Much of the time you don't know that the rectal bleeding is a result of diverticular disease, and only a small percentage of patients with diverticular disease will present with bleeding. So here are the principles. First, massive bleeding requires an OGD, so an esophago-gastroduodenoscopy, to make sure this is not a brisk upper GI bleed, where OGD may also be therapeutic in stopping it. Otherwise, it's about transfusing as necessary and correcting any coagulopathies, stabilizing your patient and waiting for the bleeding to stop. However, once you start having to transfuse more than about four units, the patient is at risk of ongoing bleeding. And where it is ongoing, angiography and embolization can be attempted or even endoscopy. Now, endoscopy can be good, but if there's a lot of blood everywhere, it makes it difficult to see anything. Now, if these fail, things get tricky. Colectomy to remove the bleeding segment of bowel carries a high risk of morbidity and mortality, not to mention the difficulty in identifying intraoperatively which segment of bowel is the one that's bleeding. In all patients with diverticular disease, the lifestyle advice to avoid acute attacks includes stopping smoking, exercising, and traditionally having a high fibre diet. When it comes to elective surgery for diverticular disease, to remove an offending diverticular segment of bowel, we have to think very carefully about the indications, risks and benefits. Let's take a look at the indications for elective resection. Indications for elective resection include repeated attacks of acute diverticulitis. So after about four episodes, the risk of further episodes is actually quite high in those younger than 50. Recurrent episodes of diverticular bleeding may also warrant resection. Patients who have a colovesical fistula, so that's a fistula between the colon and the bladder, these patients are at risk of life-threatening gram-negative urinary tract infections. And a diverticular stricture may cause large bowel obstruction, so these are further reasons why an elective resection of a diverticular segment can be considered but pick your patients well. The risk of mortality is up to 1% from an elective resection. Large bowel resection is not an operation to be taken lightly. In summary, diverticular disease, also known as diverticulosis, becomes increasingly common after age 40. It may be asymptomatic or there may be complications. Acute complications include diverticulitis and bleeding, and chronic complications include fistula and large bowel structure. Diverticulitis itself can be simple or complicated. Simple attacks require supportive therapy and antibiotics, while complicated cases might also require percutaneous drains, a laparoscopic washout, or laparotomy and Hartman's procedure, and this may depend on where the patient lies in the Hinchy classification system. After an acute episode of diverticulitis, endoscopy should be considered to make sure there is no bowel cancer, the management of diverticular bleeding is largely supportive, might involve angiography and embolization or even endoscopy, and uncommonly involves resection in the acute setting. Electively, further management of diverticular disease includes risk factor modification, so diet, exercise and stopping smoking, and in selective cases, elective colonic resection can be considered. For example, in patients with symptomatic stricture, in patients with a colovesical fistula, or in those who suffer recurrent attacks of diverticulitis. Well, that's diverticular disease in a nutshell, and I'm Danny Snitsky, surgical registrar. Now, 
test your knowledge without accompanying multiple choice questions at www.boxmedicine.com. Bye-bye.